Hi, I'm Patrick, and welcome back to ICIB. Also known as basically just updates about my cat at this point with some IR theory sprinkled in between. Today we will be talking uh, in our third lecture about the UN, about the second thing that the UN actually does. We had learned about UN peacekeeping last time, and we had also heard that UN peacekeeping was in large part based on the idea that human rights had to be protected. So it makes sense that naturally we now move on to examine which human rights actually get protected here and through what means at the UN level. So we'll be talking about human rights today. We heard that there was a certain tension uh, between two principles that the UN seemed to be founded on. The one was state sovereignty, so the idea that the domestic affairs of states should not be interfered in, and the idea that the UN also has a charge to protect human rights, um, as it also laid down in the Charter. And we heard that this might have been a a uh, fundamental opposition, or at least some states see it as a fund fundamental opposition, um, in that we can at the same time uh, protect sovereignty, absolutely, but also protect human rights of people all over the world. So the question is, is there really such a fundamental opposition, or is there simply a redefinition of what we think about state sovereignty? Have our ideas about what state sovereignty means simply changed? Maybe it's no longer an absolute shield against all interference. Maybe it is, as pointed out in the responsibility to protect, a charge of responsibility for a state. So you can't just say that uh, no one can interfere in my, in my domestic affairs. You now are re held responsible for how you treat your own citizens. And if you treat them badly, then the responsibility to protect them gets transferred to the international community and the UN and maybe even the UN Security Council, who can then launch uh, anything up to an intervention against you to stop uh, those human rights from being violated. So that's what we heard already. Before we launch into a full-on discussion, though, about human rights, it is important to understand what we're actually talking about and how human rights can be categorized and systematized. So um, the one way of um, understanding human rights is to simply divide them into so-called negative freedoms and positive freedoms. That's one way to understand them. Negative freedoms is any kind of sentence that you can start with. Um, you have freedom from something. And that normally tends to be freedom from certain constraints, uh, whether they are exerted by other people around you, whether they're exerted by the state or by general norms. So, for example, you should be free from discrimination against you. You should be free from slavery. You should be free from uh, cruel punishments by the state and so on. So all kinds of constraints that are being uh, put on your life and your liberty. Um, there could also be positive freedoms. So those are all the freedoms to do certain things. Um, and these build on negative freedoms. You need the negative freedoms first in order to then have the freedom to do certain things. So, for example, being free to express yourself, being free to be an active member of society and shape your life without undue outside interference. Um, so that's one way of dividing up these rights, really, really broadly speaking. We can look at the right hand side here and we can find a slightly more fine grained view of this. So if we first think about um, human rights on the one side, and human rights really are the, are the rights that everyone has, that is within a, a certain territory uh, of a certain state. So everyone should obviously have the right to life, to liberty, to security. Everyone should have the right to pursue work and to get an education. And maybe everyone also has the right to a peaceful uh, environment and maybe even a natural environment that they can enjoy. So those are the rights of everyone who is anywhere. Then we have on the other side a class of rights that tends to only be extended to citizens of a specific country. So note that, of course, everyone has the right to life. You can't just extend that to your citizens. But not everyone that lives in a country, say a resident such as me, has, for example, the right to participate in all um, kinds of political movements. So not everyone might be free to form associations, but your citizens should have that right. Your citizens should have the right to demonstrate. That right might not, might not be there for non-citizens. And your citizens also can normally choose their occupation freely. Again, that is something that might not be open to everyone that lives in your country. 
Um, I, for example, as a resident of the UK at the moment, am allowed to vote in certain elections, but I'm not allowed to vote in others. And that means that certain citizens' rights are extended to me, but others are kept to um, proper UK citizens. So these human rights and the citizen rights uh, tend to combine in, into something that we call fundamental rights. And these fundamental rights didn't all come about at the same time. We tend to be able to divide these up into specific generations of rights because the, there is a chronological logic to these. The very first uh, type of rights that came about mostly in sort of the 19th century are the first generation protective rights. And they were all about protecting individuals from the state. The state here would, tended to be the problem that had to be solved. And this is sort of very the liberal thinkers kind of way of uh, thinking about rights. So these were all the things that you had to be protected from the state from. Um, so your life, for example, your equality in front of the law, um, your freedom of speech, your freedom of religion, your right to vote and certain other things. Those all had to be protected against a state that might want to take them away from you. So the first generation rights were protective rights. Um, the second generation rights came after that, and those are more 20th century rights that built on the first generation rights. And this was now the state protecting you um, from something. Uh, so no longer did you need protection from the state, but you needed to be protected by the state. So for example, your right to be employed, your right to food, your right to housing, these welfare rights that didn't allow us to, when we fell out of work, to just starve in the street, basically, the right to health care, the right to social security. Of course, these are not uniformly uh, distributed across all countries, but generally speaking, we consider these to be equality rights. So they try to put everyone on a more or less equal footing, or at least provide a basic safety net uh, under which no one can fall. And then we have these more 21st century rights, maybe uh, development rights, also called third generation rights here. And this is now a fairly far reaching conception of rights in that these are really safeguards that go far beyond just protecting your sort of base existence, um, such as you having food or housing. Um, these are things like the right to self-determination of peoples, the right to exploit your own natural resources, the right to communicate, maybe even a right to a sustainable environment. And we can already see that these are pretty far reaching and they go beyond just the um, base level protection of the first and second generation rights. So the important takeaway part from this slide here is really that we need to think really clearly about which types of rights we're we're talking about, which are being discussed, which are also being under threat. For example, is it truly, uh, is it citizens' rights that are under threat or is it truly human rights that are under threat here? Because those two things might not be the same thing. And uh, the uh, addressee of uh, the problem might also be a different one. A different type of actor might be threatening the one compared to the other. So how are, the, how are these types of human rights then anchored at the UN? Well, uh, we look at our trusty UN Charter, like always, and we see that in the preamble already, uh, the UN Charter says that we, the peoples of the UN, uh, reaffirm their faith in fundamentally human rights, in the dignity of the human person, and in the equal rights of men and women, and in nations large and small. And we see, of course, this is these core liberal values of equality, of a level playing field for everyone. And then uh, chapter one, article three, uh, article one says that the purposes of the UN are to protect and encourage respect for human rights and for fundamental freedoms without distinction as to race, sex, language or religion. There's a couple of categories that we might uh, that are, are missing here, for example. So gender identity, for example, is not part of the charter, but there is at least the attempt really to found the UN, build the UN on the basis of uh, a respect for human rights and for human freedoms. Article 55 um, says, interestingly enough, uh, that human rights are linked to other things. And this is really a core kind of narrative figure in how the UN thinks about these things and how human rights are discussed at the UN. So Article 55 says that uh, the conditions of stability and well-being which are necessary for peaceful and friendly relations are based on the respect for the principle of equal rights. 
So equal rights and human rights are actually the basis of stability and peace, which is, of course, quite a... I mean, you could consider it a tiny bit of a leap of the imagination to immediately go from human rights to international peace and security. But of course, international peace and security is what the UN is founded on. So whenever you can tie something to that goal, you can automatically make it much more relevant and much more important. And then it goes even further, this Article 55. It says, in order to promote this principle of human rights, the U UN shall promote higher standards of living and development. So we need development to properly protect human rights. We need solutions of international problems. And we need a universal respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms without distinction. So again, we come back to this figure that this should be uh, that this, these human rights should be protected for everyone. So mind you, A, B, and C all together speak to the main the maintenance of stability and international peace. So human rights, solutions to international problems, and development all are tied to um, uh, stability and peace. And that, of course, is uh, quite a uh, nice little. Um, a discourse or a change in the discourse here where we tie something that is undoubtedly within the UN's um, uh, mission and that is peace and stability to something that might be considered to be uh, not part of that core mission namely human rights and development but at least article 55 tells us that those two things are inextricably, uh, inextricably linked um, now, the uh, maybe the most fundamental document that we look at when we think about a human rights protection at the UN is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it's a very fascinating document. It fits on a, on a wonderful uh, poster, such as being uh, the one that's being held up by Eleanor Roosevelt in 1948, who pushed very strongly for this Universal Declaration, of course, the wife of the then US president. Um, she was one of the major international figures uh, of this movement to um, codify human rights in a declaration at the UN level. And so this specifies and enumerates all kinds of different political, economic, social and civil rights. Uh, it was adopted by the General Assembly. Of course, like everything adopted by the General Assembly, this means it is non-binding. Um, and even at the time, certain nations abstained from voting for it. Maybe those are some of the usual suspects. Saudi Arabia has always had a bit of a suspect human rights record. South Africa, of course, uh, had apartheid and the USSR was not known as a paragon of human rights at the time. Because it's a General Assembly um, uh, document, a resolution, there is no provisions for monitoring or enforcement. So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights cannot be enforced. Um, and there is, of course, a um, a uh, discussion to be had whether promoting it means something different than protecting it and is promotion not really a mm, sort of poor cousin to protection so it's all nice and good to promote these human rights around the world but isn't what we really need the protection of them the construction of this uh, universal declaration of human rights is really fascinating though if you read through it it's not a very long document and it's very wonderfully constructed so in the preamble, the reasons are outlined why we even need this type of de declaration. Articles 1 and 2 then talk about sort of these fundamental protective rights, freedom, equality, dignity, and these rights that these rights apply to everyone. And for example, not just citizens. We then have four different columns with major rights in them. The first column between Articles 3 and 11 uh, enumerates some fundamental individual rights. And for example, the right to due process under law. Uh, we have individual political and civil rights, so the right, for example, to vote and to participate in the political process. We have public and political liberties, so for example, forming associations, forming parties, and we have social, economic, and cultural rights in the fourth column, um, all the way up until Article 27. And then at the top of that come the uh, come sort of the capstone articles 28 to 30. They, uh, uh, tell you something about how individuals and society are connected and that everyone that is a UN member state and that signs up to this universal declaration cannot work towards destructing uh, destroying these rights. Um, so the declaration in its, in its own text kind of has a uh, wonderful couple of clauses that talk about uh, no one uh, that no one should work against them. Now, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a wonderfully written document with very nice language, but it's not a particularly detailed one. Uh, 
1966, the General Assembly decided that it wanted to have uh, two more documents that further specified which rights ex especially should be protected and how. And out of this process came the International Covenant on Civil, Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And these cover much of the same ground as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They just go into uh, much more detail. So normally these three documents, the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the two International Covenants, they are basically just stapled together and considered the International Bill of Human Rights. And sometimes this is published, as you see on the right here. Uh, what I love the most is the little blurb at the bottom. Never before in book form, the ultimate statement of freedom and human dignity. That kind of sounds like a movie trailer to me. So um, this is really the core kind of um, corpus that makes up the international human rights uh, uh, catalog, uh, if you will. So um, that is not the only part, though, of the international human rights regime. Uh, other parts uh, also are uh, form its basis. And the uh, most important ones are 10 distinct treaties that have been signed between 1948 and 2006 was the last one. Um, and these treaties are, of course, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, and the two covenants that are already mentioned. There is also an International Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide that came out in 1948. And then we had between 1969 and the 2000s a succession of documents and conventions that all targeted specific human rights abuses or human rights violations and intended to codify uh, that this was not okay and what could be done against them. And um, what it shows a little bit is how the international discourse evolved around which human rights should be protected or rather whose human rights should be protected. So we see that racial discrimination was the first convention followed by the discrimination of women. Uh, we then had a convention against torture and the convention on the rights of the child. Um, one of my favorite facts is always that the convention of the rights of the child has a very interesting uh, list of states that haven't ratified it. And I will talk about that in a second. Uh, we then had the two newest con uh, conventions that protected the rights of migrants and the members of their families. And in 2006, the convention on the rights of persons with disabilities. If you notice, by the way, there's a couple of things that might be missing here. Uh, maybe the most common one is there is no convention on the rights of LGBTQ people. Um, there is no right, uh, convention on the, uh, on the rights of people with different gender identities. And that is something that's been in the works at the UN for quite a while, but hasn't quite made the made its way to the convention stage yet. And that is because, of course, as we all know, there is a number of countries at the UN that would be very strongly opposed against such a convention, for example, on cultural or religious grounds. Now, it's important to understand that when I say a convention has been passed, that these conventions tend to not reach universal ratification. So there are some conventions that are basically universally adopted by almost every state in the world. And that is, for example, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, with the notable exception of the US. For the longest time, the only two UN member states that hadn't ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child were the US and Somalia. And Somalia didn't even have a functioning government. But a couple of years ago, even Somalia got around to ratifying it. And now the US is the lone holdout against the Convention of the Rights of the Child. You can speculate yourself why that is. Now, you have to know, of course, that the US Senate has to sign off on any international treaties, including this convention. And you could think about the political parties in the US and their, their, um, their respective bases and see if you can spot a pattern here why they wouldn't sign the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, other conventions are fairly widespread. So the Convention Against Torture has been signed by 164, I believe, countries. Uh, the Convention on Civil and Political Rights is fairly widely accepted. But then we see that uh, some additional protocols to these conventions that further specify certain rights tend to be signed and ratified by far fewer states. Those are all the bars in yellow. And we also can see that some of the more modern conventions in the past couple of years uh, so the economic, uh, so for example, the Convention on the Rights of Migrant Workers here has only been signed by 40 UN member states. So that is about a fifth of all uh, UN members. 
even fewer ones have assigned the convention on the protection of all persons from enforced disappearance and i was already talking about this that this is a crime against humanity that you can also commit in peacetime uh, and occasionally this ha has been used to justify R the r2p principle uh, being at work against such violations of human rights so no universal adoption really around the world so let's think about this a little more uh, broadly here. Uh, what is the current human rights situation globally? What is the situation that the UN has to deal with? Now, this comes from the Freedom in the World 2020 report by Freedom House. We're all hopefully well aware that the Freedom House methodology has been criticized. This is not the best possible way to, uh, to judge the status of human rights, but it is one that is readily available and very frequently updated. So that's where we're going with it for the next couple of slides. So we see here the world basically falls into three broad categories that Freedom House categor uh, categorizes as free, partly free, and not free. We see that uh, several countries, almost all the countries in Europe, North America, and South America tend to fall into the free category, while uh, Africa and Asia has far fewer free countries. The partly free countries tend to be concentrated in Africa, parts of Latin America, and in Eastern Europe, and the non-free countries constitute the rest of the world. And as you can see, that is a large part of the world's population that lives in non-free countries. It includes big countries in Africa, it includes Russia, Central Asia, and China, of course, which alone has 1.2 billion people. So that's a lot of people that live in situations where their human rights are not fully protected, at least according to the Freedom House methodology. Now you can test yourself. This is my little uh, take a second to think slide uh, that I'm now somehow required to do in every lecture. Uh, if I had to, if I made you guess which countries rank number one through five, uh, and I think this is the numbers from last year, I haven't updated these, mea culpa, um, which are the states that rank the highest in terms of protecting their, their uh, inhabitants' human rights, and which countries do you think score lowest? Um, you can uh, give it a little try, try to fill out both of these uh, tables for a second. And as you see, by the way, the scores go all the way from 100 to a score of zero here, down here. Okay, so you probably came up with some of these. You might have said Iceland. Iceland's actually not up there. It's Finland, Sweden, and Norway. At least it was in 2019. These will only have changed a tiny bit. Uh, followed by the Netherlands and uh, Canada. So you see most of the European states at the top here. And by the way, I just noticed that the scores are the wrong way around. There should be a three at the top and a zero at the bottom. And you see that the uh, major uh, uh, violators of human rights tend to sit in areas that are either um, uh, uh, wrecked by conflict or they are simply autocratic dictatorial states uh, that don't really extend any types of human rights, especially not civil and political rights to their citizens. And the usual suspects here are North Korea, South Sudan, and Syria, of course. So you see there's a bit of a, we essentially see the same division as we saw on the map already, is that the higher scoring countries tend to be in the Western world and the lower scoring countries tend to be in the global South. Although there are some exceptions from the pattern because, for example, South America scores quite highly uh, on average in the Freedom in the World Index. Now, in terms of overall trends, uh, what we can see here is a couple of things. The blue line shows you the free countries, the black line, the partly free countries, and the red line shows you the not free countries. And you see here that the not free countries were actually in the majority, globally speaking, in the 1970s. And this trend really only turned around after the end of the Cold War with all the all of Eastern Europe basically a turning towards democracy. The red line sharply declined in favor of the blue line. But what we can also say, say is that in the past 20 years or so, these lines are more or less static. Not very much progress has been made. It seems that countries that are already not fully respecting human rights at sort of 20 years back were also not fully respecting them today. And broadly speaking, this is a correct um, evaluation of the trends as we see. And there might even be some backsliding here globally. As Freedom House points out in its most recent report, it says that uh, if you chart which countries from year to year have improved their scores, which countries have improved their human rights record, and you juxtapose those with the countries whose human rights record has declined, 
that we can see that the bottom, the net declines, have at least in the past um, almost uh, 15 years now outweighed the countries in which there have been gains. So overall, globally, the human rights situation is actually not improving, but as a net, it seems to be declining, which of course is a very worrying trend. Uh, not just if you study IR, but just as a citizen and as a human. Now, um, let's turn from this general evaluation of what human rights are and how the human rights situation looks globally to how the UN actually deals with human rights. And I've brought back this wonderful little chart that shows you all the different things uh, that the UN system consists of. Because we saw already that this is a highly complex system and are also hinted already at the fact that this is a bit of a mess in that oftentimes the same issue is being dealt with with several by several organs and committees and other subsidiary bodies and we see that the same is true really for you for the human rights situation if we go through here we see that at the very least several general assembly bodies are concerned with human rights such as the human rights council which we'll come to in a second but also important actors such as the Human High Commissioner for Refugees or UN Women, the Entity for Gender Equality. We also know already that the Security Council, of course, is involved in protecting human rights because after all, that is one of the things that it's charged to do, protecting peace and security, and that might well involve protecting human rights. Also, criminal tribunals that are set up to investigate breaches of human rights are tend to report back to the Security Council. The UN Secretariat is involved in certain areas uh, because it uh, uh, provides, for example, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights down here, a very important office, or the Office of the Special Representative for Children and Armed Conflict that deals with things like child soldiers, uh, or the Special Representative on Sexual Violence and Conflict, that of course is a scourge of conflict that's been around for a very long time. Um, and then uh, we, of course, have an organization that I've put on here, even though it's not a direct uh, UN organ. That's the International Criminal Court, not to be confused with the International Court of Justice. Remember that the International Court of Justice is the body where states uh, basically sue each other over perceived breaches uh, of international treaties, for example, while the International Criminal Court actually can investigate, for example, human rights violations uh, committed by individuals, which is something that the International Court of Justice tends to not do. So you already see one of the blessings, but also one of the curses of the UN system, and that is that multiple people, multiple bodies, multiple organs all have to do with human rights. Sometimes their um, responsibilities overlap, sometimes they don't. Now, um, the UN Security Council, we heard already that it's been using Chapter 7 much more ever since the end of the Cold War. Uh, I talked about that in the peacekeeping lecture, of course, and it was using Chapter 7 to protect civilians, for example, from gross human rights violations, sometimes through the application of the R2P principle. And it can take any types of actions against violations of human rights. It can... Uh, enact economic sanctions, it can uh, refer cases to the International Criminal Court, and it can even take military action if there were uh, big enough violations of human rights. Uh, there's a specific text on the reading list that talks about the Security Council's role in protecting human rights specifically. The General Assembly, we already heard, was a, is an important body because it, after all, has passed all these revolution, uh, revolutions, sorry, all these resolutions, uh, conventions, and uh, the, the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, it is perhaps a more indirect role in that it provides the basis, but it doesn't really provide any of the enforcement for uh, against human rights violations. But of course, I would argue, as we talked about in the last live stream also, that the UN General Assembly has quite a significant symbolic impact in that when the UN General Assembly passes a resolution that recognizes a specific group for example, and recognizes that these groups, this group's rights are being violated and that they shouldn't be, that has a symbolic impact and that changes the international discourse. It sometimes gets harder for countries to argue that certain rights should not be protected if you can already point to the UN General Assembly having passed a resolution to that effect. 
Um, and what we've seen in the UN General Assembly is that there has been a shift from a Cold War divide to more of a North-South divide over human rights issues. So during the Cold War, it was always it was often the West versus the East in terms of which human rights had to be protected and to what degree, while now it is very much a North-South divide in this regard. Now, there are a couple of... Uh, 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 bodies that I've already referred to. So the Secretary General has an important role in promoting human rights at the very least. The Secretary General, of course, is not an enforcement organ. Uh, he doesn't have any uh, particular powers himself, but they can certainly, again, shift the public discourse. Ever since Kofi Annan, the UN Secretary Generals have been quite vocal in, for example, their condemnation of human rights violations. And this also includes the backing by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights that again sends a bit of a signal. There is now a designated person at the UN level that is purely responsible for protecting human rights and promoting human rights um, all over the UN system and outside of it. So the High Commissioner here, um, and you see the succession of people, um, this was uh, Navanethan Pillai first from South Africa, it was Saidrat Al Hussein from Jordan and is now Michelle Bachelet uh, from Chile since 2018. These people, these high commissioners oversee all the UN's human rights activities. So they have a bit of a vague but broad mandate. So they're kind of the ghost hovering over the waters in a sense. And the, their key challenge is that they want to be forceful in condemning human rights violations but they still have to maintain the support of member states. So you can call member states out, but you should probably care about not calling too many out or too strongly because that will uh, affect how much support the human rights regime at the UN gets in the first place. Now, um, there are a couple of so-called treaty bodies um, that have been set up to oversee the implementation of specific conventions and of specific sets of human rights. And these are really, really important organs. They're all called Committee on Something, and they will be uh, linked to specific conventions, as I said. Now, while these bodies are interesting, is that they are not staffed by member state representatives. So you don't have, say, the representative from Sudan in there or the representative from Ecuador and so on. These are independent experts. So these are essentially expert panels that tend to monitor the implementation of specific conventions. Uh, and what you see here already is there tends to be, mm, again, sometimes a tiny bit of attention because, for example, you have both a committee against torture and also a subcommittee on the prevention of torture within the same system, uh, sometimes even reporting to the same people. So there can be some uh, overlap and some redundancies, certainly, but these play a very large role in establishing the facts, so to say. So once this, these independent experts body, expert bodies have determined that human rights have been violated in specific cases and by whom, it becomes much more difficult for those states affected by this to argue that this wasn't actually happening. Now, two things that are uh, really important and you probably already knew about, uh, two bodies that maybe... Uh, constitute the center of the human rights machinery, the human rights regime at the UN, are the Commission on Human Rights, which is a body that existed for about 60 years, and that was then uh, superseded by the Human Rights Council. So the Human Rights Commission first, and then the Human Rights Council, which is its current shape since 2006. Now, the, their job is more or less the same. Uh, this is a specific UN body that is de uh, designed to examine, monitor, and report human rights violations. And they tend to do this through working groups and through having rapporteurs uh, prepare reports that then give an overview in, uh, on the implementation of rights and they point out who has violated these. Now, almost from the very beginning, um, the uh, Commission on Human Rights had to face the criticism that especially Western states were sometimes using human rights issues as a cover for their own self-interest. So, uh, for example, uh, parts of the Eastern Bloc and the developing world at the time uh, were accusing Western states of basically using human rights as a cudgel, as a uh, club to continuously call out and... Um, 
and accuse other states of wrongdoing and that this commission basically just provided a convenient forum for Western states to uh, have it out with everyone else. The Human Rights Council has also faced this criticism to a slightly lesser part, but it's faced an additional criticism that I'll talk about in a second. So ever since the Human Rights Council has come around, and by the way, that's the room there that you see on the right-hand side that has this amazing art installation on the ceiling that looks like this inverted sort of mushroom world. Um, uh, so a great room, really. Uh, it's used increasingly fact-finding commissions. So again, this is already a council, which is a sub sub committee, uh, which is a sub organ of another organ and it creates its own sub organs uh, that deal with specific human rights sets of human rights or violations of human rights. The Human Rights Council has been somewhat effective. It's set standards in certain areas, but uh, oftentimes it is too politicized to be uh, very effective, especially in the short term. Now, the core problem here with the Human Rights Council over the past couple of years has been one of legitimacy. And that stems from the uh, composition of the Human Rights Council. Now, mind you, the Human Rights Council doesn't have all UN member states in it. You have to be elected to the Human Rights Council. These elections tend to work in regional groups. But if we look back at the map, uh, the Freedom in the World map, uh, by Freedom House, we also know that certain regions overall have poor human rights records. So any states that get elected from those regions will probably have poor human rights records. And um, in these particular cases, we've seen that states like Russia, states like Saudi Arabia, states like Sudan have been elected to the Human Rights Council, even though they have atrocious human rights records. So how in the world can we trust a council to oversee the implementation of human rights if those that are sitting on that council are themselves the violators of those rights? And that has been one of the core legitimacy problems really uh, with the Human Rights Council um, for quite a while. Now, um, there is another important aspect of the human rights machinery at the UN, and those are the judicial forms of uh, prosecuting human rights violations. Now, there's two different ways in which these tend to be set up. You either have something that is called an ad hoc tribunal, and these are basically temporary courts that are set up to investigate specific instances of human rights violations, and oftentimes these are being set up for specific conflicts. So there is, for example, the ICTY, the International Criminal Tribunal, uh, on Yugoslavia to investigate human rights violations during the uh, civil war and the breakup of the of former Yugoslavia, and the ICTR, which is the International Criminal Tribunal on Rwanda, which has the same mission, just uh, relating to the genocide in Rwanda. So this is the one way that this could be set up. It's an ad hoc tribunal. It's a temporary court that investigates specific people as to their culpability, their involvement in human rights violations. And once these people have been prosecuted and either let go or put into prison, then the tribunal has uh, done its job and it dissolves. But of course, we have a permanent international court that is designed to investigate human rights violations. And that is the International Criminal Court in The Hague. This is a permanent court and it's based on a treaty. Not all uh, member states uh, of the UN are partners, uh, are parties to this, and I will show you that in a second. And this is a court that has jurisdiction over international crimes. And if you look at this um, a list, this looks suspiciously like the list that we already talked about when we discussed R2P. So this covers genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and also uh, uh, cr the crime of uh, aggression, meaning you launched a war against another state. But this is a relatively rare thing to be investigated for. Now, the court is technically independent, but there has been a process established where the UN Security Council uh, refers crimes to the court and the court then decides to take those up. Uh, that was, for example, the case in Libya. Now, there's a couple of problems with this court. Um, the first is that there is simply no guarantee that UN member states will comply. Um, there is a, a, a number of UN member states that are not a part to the international to the statute of the International Criminal Court, and that means they simply can ignore anything that the International Criminal Court wants from them, especially when the International Criminal Court needs their cooperation to bring violators against human rights to justice. Um, there's been one famous case 
where the uh, former president of uh, Sudan, uh, Omar al-Bashir, uh, who oversaw uh, human rights violations in the Darfur region, saw an, uh, an arrest warrant issued in 2009. So the International Criminal Court issued an international arrest warrant that any state that basically catches Omar al-Bashir should send him to the Hague. And even after this arrest warrant was issued, um, and I have to read this off because it's a long line of countries, many countries refused to uh, cooperate with the court and Bashir al-Bashir traveled to China, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Qatar. He traveled around the world, including his own country, of course, without getting arrested. So um, there is not always a very high level of compliance with the things that the, UN, that the International Criminal Court uh, issues. And by the way, I've given you at the bottom uh, a picture that I love. That is the UN Detention Center in The Hague. So there's a tiny little prison in The Hague uh, that's overseen by the Dutch uh, prison system that is being used to house violators against uh, human rights, uh, either while they're in court or where they have to uh, live out the rest of their sentence if they're being sentenced to prison. And I can see in the very back there is like a Windows XP computer. I think that's like cruel and unusual uh, punishment. The main problem really, realistically, that the International Criminal Court has is simply that there is no universal ratification of it. So uh, if you look at this map really quickly, um, you will see that uh, the green states here are full parties to the treaty. Um, so those are the states that support the International Criminal Court that have both signed and ratified the treaty. Those two things are different, by the way. You can sign a treaty as it comes out, but then you have to get normally your domestic legislature to also sign off on it. Um, and that then means you ratify it. There's plenty of states that sign on to things, but then don't ratify it. And for them, that treaty isn't in force. So the green states are full parties. And you see that this is uh, most of Europe, most of the Americas, with the notable exception of the US. There's also a quite a large part of Africa and Oceania. You see that there's a further number of countries that have signed the treaty but not ratified it. That means what I just explained. And you have a couple of countries that have withdrawn from the treaty. So they were previously signatories to it, but they have since withdrawn. This is notably the US. This has been Russia and Sudan. And also, by the way, the Philippines, which are shown in a different color here. So there's a number of countries that um, are no longer parties to the to the treaty and there is a number of uh, countries that have never been a party here and you see that these are countries that have previously also been accused of human rights violations countries such as pakistan china um, or south sudan for example somalia is also in here and libya so um, there is no universal acceptance of the statute of the international criminal court and that's of course a problem if the crimes are committed in non-party states because then you essentially have to hope that the person, that the perpetrator gets caught by a member of the International Criminal Court and then gets delivered to The Hague. Uh, if that's not the case, then you're basically out of luck. But there's no real judicial recourse for you. Now, um, so uh, there is a discussion, of course, to be had. Oops, sorry. The discussion, of course, to be had about the question of sovereignty versus human rights. We already alluded to this a little bit in the previous slides. And in the very beginning, I also said that there was a discussion whether the norm of state sovereignty was essentially a higher norm than the protection of human rights. And if so, what consequences that could be, uh, that could have for our thinking about human rights protections. We have heard, for example, that especially during the Cold War, and nowadays, maybe from some states of the global south, the charge has been leveled at mostly the global north or the western states. Yet human rights are sometimes used as a weapon in what is actually a power struggle. So western states basically using human rights or a specific western definition of human rights as a, as a tool really to keep other states down, to hamper their progress or to publicly shame and humiliate them. Um, this is the first kind of area where there's been some contention. Uh, we've also seen, of course, that there has been much more uh, progress achieved in some areas, and by no means is that 
uh, progress perfect of course but there have been there has been undoubtedly more uh, more progress achieved in women's rights for example than in lgbtq rights um, we've also seen that regional groups and political blocs are using their collective weight to promote certain common objectives and that that can lead to its own problems so we see that certain regions are much more likely to have uh, different conceptions of human rights sometimes much more limited conceptions of what human rights actually consist of and also who these human rights should be extended to but they sometimes have quite a quite a significant weight in the processes we have seen some uh, evidence though from research from actual empirical research that protecting human rights does advance international peace and security. So we can empirically show that states that protect their uh, citizens or their other uh, inhabitants' human rights tend to also be more peaceful and tend to be more geared towards uh, a cooperative mindset at the international level. Now, the UN has played one central key role in this discussion between sovereignty and human rights and our conception of human rights, and that has been that they have that the UN, much more than many nation states, have taken the notion of human security much more on board in that security should be primarily thought of on the individual level rather than the state level. And this has been pushed in many UN organs over the years. So, of course, if we always think about security in terms of uh, the state level, so how do we keep states secure, we can really ignore almost all issues of human rights because oftentimes human rights violations have no bearing on other states' security or not even on the security of the state that is violating those rights. We've heard in the critical theories lecture, though, that there is such a thing as critical security studies. And much of what critical security studies has done is refocus the discussion around security, around the human, around the individual, really, and protecting that person's uh, security rather than just the state. Um, because, of course, as the UN points out in its own human development report, for most people, a feeling of insecurity arises more from worries about daily life than from the dread of a cataclysmic world event. So there's questions of whether your, you and your family will have enough to eat, whether they will keep their jobs, whether they will be safe from crime, whether they might be tortured or they might be a victim of violence because of their gender or religion or ethnicity. So um, this notion that security and human rights have to be at the core of what we do in terms of providing security, that is really... Uh, a discussion that's been pushed very strongly at the UN and that has arguably changed the international discourse around what providing security actually means. We now have a more complex understanding of security and the UN's role in protecting security because we now consider human security being fundamental, uh, to be a, a fundamental part of this. Uh, we, do, are, we are still fighting, though, at the UN, uh, a oftentimes a sort of... One of the issues, though, that the discourse around human security at the UN is still struggling under is that there is different conceptions at the UN as to which uh, aspects of human security should be protected and which human rights should be protected alongside it. So it's often difficult to achieve sort of a general level of understanding and a compromise and a, and a common language at the UN uh, among all those states in the room as to what human rights and what human security actually means. So are we really only talking about basic human rights, the physical integrity, legal rights, political rights? Are we mostly talking about rights of individuals uh, during war and conflict? So is this a discussion then that immediately veers into the area of peace building and peacemaking and peacekeeping? Or are we talking about the rights of individuals that are experiencing deprivation or hardship uh, due to cataclysmic events or, or, or sudden disasters? And none of these discussions quite uh, are the same, of course. Both the ones affected by these issues are different, but also the solutions towards addressing them are different. And so that sometimes makes discussions at the UN very difficult because different states have different conceptions as to what the UN's role is and which human rights actually are being discussed or should be discussed. Now, um, the important link here to the next lecture after having today then heard about what human rights actually consist of and where they are being protected at the UN and maybe how good a job it's doing is that human rights are intrinsically linked to development. We've already heard that on one of the first slides. 
And as the Human Development Report puts it very nicely, um, it says it will not be possible for the community of nations to achieve any of its major goals, not peace, not environmental protection, not human rights, not democratization, not fertility reduction, not social integration, except in the context of sustainable development. So after we've already said that in order to achieve peace, we need human rights. Now we go even more fundamental, even more deep. And we say even for human rights, what we really need is development. Without development, we can't protect human rights. And without human rights, we can't uh, protect peace. So you've heard hopefully today about um, the different conceptions of human rights, what it includes, where at the UN they're being dealt with and which bodies are, being, are, are dealing with them. You've seen that much progress has been made as to codifying human rights in specific conventions and protecting specific groups against abuses of their rights. And you've heard that there's a number of organs involved in protecting them and not all of those are necessarily perfect. So. From human rights, we now move to the arguably maybe even more fundamental topic of international development and how the UN deals with this and how it can foster this uh, around the world. So I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.